I believe we can begin. Um, good afternoon, colleagues, uh, Twane colleagues in the tourism sector and other related sectors. Thank you very much for making time to join us today for our first webinar. Um, and um, also I'd like to uh, firstly introduce myself. My name is Mandlan Lovu. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at TIDA, uh, the Twane Economic Development Agency. Um, the Twane Economic Devel Development Agency has now become responsible for destination marketing. This is a recent development, so we're still uh, working around creating and building that team um, that is going to be responsible for destination marketing, which includes at its heart, at its heart uh, tourism. Um, and our objective as TIDA is to position the city as a capable uh, in, uh, destination for both tourism and investment um, to, to, to show and demonstrate that Tswane is a welcoming destination uh, to grow business tourism, to grow our MICE activities. Um, uh, but also very importantly, it's to help uh, drive transformation within the, the, the sector, as well as to unite us around our, our tourism objectives. Um, so this is just one of the activities that we've started, uh, started with uh, as the new constituted um, uh, body responsible for driving uh, destination marketing, this series of webinars. Uh, so this is uh, number one in the series and we'll be uh, giving you more information on other webinars that are going to be uh, coming through. We are also happy that some of you have already engaged with us in the development of the destination marketing strategy. And I'd like to thank you uh, for those who, who made time to participate on that. Um, now getting into today's uh, webinar, um, we know that COVID-19 has been a, a big problem for our sector, particularly our sector. I know everyone has, uh, has suffered losses but I don't believe there's a sector that has suffered as much losses as we have. Um, but I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We've seen in some countries, um, there's already, if you look at Spain, Greece, India, there's already some semblance of opening, even though the virus has not really left us. Um, also with um, the announcement by the Minister of Tourism that some elements of our sector um, are ready to be open uh, or can be open to, to a limited degree, I think that gives us hope that um, we, we, can, we can work our way out of this disaster. Um, and out of every disaster, there should be some opportunity. And um, I believe as the tourist, tourism sector of Tswana, we should use this disaster to come out shining uh, over uh, shoulder and above our, our, our peers in other destinations. We should be the ones who are saying we are ready um, uh, for safer tourism. We are ready to be pioneers in safer tourism post COVID. Um, and that is why we're having this webinar today to talk about what can we do as a, as a sector of Tswane to become the shining beacon around safer tourism um, so that uh, other destinations, actually other destinations look uh, up to us uh, on what can be done. Um, and we are joined by, um, in that discussion, by the CEO of the Tourism Business Council of South Africa. Uh, you all know him, he needs no introduction, Chief Chivengwa. Uh, he's gonna be taking us through some of the protocols that they have discussed extensively with government uh, around um, the opening of the sector. And for me, it's not just the opening of the sector, it's the new normal around the tourism sector. Um, we'll also be joined, we are joined by Nico Rowan, who is the vice chairperson of the Swana Tourism Association. Um, and he's, he's also going to talk about what are some of the initiatives that TTA is undertaking. Um, we have Biula Musupe from Howeng Business Services. Um, uh, uh, before we are a tourism sector, we are also businesses and we need to uh, build resilience uh, around our, our businesses and she'll be taking us through 
some uh, some of those tips. Um, we have Solanim Tetwa from the Dinukeng Tourism Association, uh, Tourism Organization, as well as we also need to 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 have a voice of what a visitor would want from us, and we've asked. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Susan Mare to join us and talk to us from a perspective of what would a visitor expect from, from us. Um, you will also be able to send us questions through the Q&A um, function there. Uh, please make sure that when you send a question, you direct it to a specific panelist so we can be able to uh, answer your questions competently. Um, now that we've done uh, all the introductions, um, I'd like to start with Chifiwa. Chifiwa, you have had, uh, uh, as the TPS, TPVSA, uh, an opportunity to engage on behalf of the sector, along with SAT, with government, on what we as a sector can do uh, to uh, make uh, our, our sector safe for opening and safer for tourism for the future. Can you take us through some of those protocols and what our businesses can do to be able to live up to those protocols and, um, and what Twani can do to be able to be the leader in the implementation of those protocols? Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, the development of the protocols came as a response uh, in we as a sector. Um, I'm going to switch off my camera so that I can be audible because uh, sometimes the internet is not as stable. I'm, I hope that you can hear me. We can, thank you. Thank you. So the, devel the, de the development of the... Of the um, uh, a protocols came as an answer to you know the risk adjusted strategy that government has put together uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know when the government uh, said we we're going to ease out the lockdown part of the easing part of the easing out of the lockdown is to say how do we ensure that uh, when we ease out the lockdown uh, all industries across all sectors are able to operate you know within the safety guidelines uh, that the industries uh, can put together themselves. Now, let me go back a little bit. Uh, when we did this, uh, you know, we had a meeting as industry leaders and we said, well, this is the situation that we have at hand. We're either gonna wait for government to open tourism at level two uh, or one, uh, as it was envisaged, you know, at the risk adjusted uh, uh, strategy. Uh, and we said, well, if we wait until then, we won't have anything left in tourism to wait for. So therefore we need to really look at, you know, how do we de-risk the sector and open up as early as we can. And that's when we said, you know, the first step to do is to develop protocols in which you're gonna operate under this situation that we are at currently, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, and just to add on this is to say that we may not have post COVID, we may operate with COVID, you know, for the near future, uh, you know, until such time that the vaccine is found. But if we wait until 18 months or two years, like I've said, nothing will be left, you know, of the industry. And that's why we then went and say to the industry, everyone go out there, talk to your value chain uh, uh, throughout the tourism industry and come back to us with protocols that will mitigate the spread you know, of the virus. And, the, and these protocols were consulted widely, um, you know, from uh, small guest houses to large hotel groups to car rentals of all sizes to safari, you know, destination. Uh, and they took into consideration adventure activities and many other things, you know, that are tourism related. Uh, and then we came up with these protocols. We then put together a team uh, to look at what uh, the industry came up with, uh, a team of few people from all subsectors of our of our industry, they looked into these protocols. Then they came back and said, "These are the final protocols, you know, that we can uh, we can put on the table." This includes restaurants, 
uh, both take away and sit down restaurants. Now, this is, you know, a step by the industry, uh, both members of TBCSA and non-members of the TBCSA who have came together to say, how do we de-risk the sector? We put together the document. We have sent out the document to everyone. It's quite extensive uh, because it goes probably around 20 something odd pages. Uh, and it gives the guidelines in terms of how to operate under the situation that we're in. And now when we operate under the situation that we're in, uh, you know, we need to comply. Uh, there won't be anyone who's going to be coming to us and saying, you know, comply, comply, comply. Uh, we need to ensure that ourselves comply with this. We need to ensure that, you know, this makes, uh, 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 you know, it can be implementable. Uh, we need to get the PPEs that we need to get. We need to do distancing in that uh, put out on those uh, on those uh, uh, protocols. So, so self-regulatory uh, mechanism to say we can open as a sector uh, on the basis that uh, uh, you know these things are done. Thank you. Um, First, I think we need to commend uh, TPCSA as well as SAT uh, for taking leadership here, especially because, as you say, Chifua, you've worked with members and non-members as well. And it's important that we also take ownership of, of the protocols. If we say we are actually going to do these things, that we do these things. Um, and um, I think perhaps from the TTA perspective, um, Nico, you work with um, the direct uh, implementers of tourism on the ground, product owners, etc. cetera. Um, how do you view the protocols? And you can then also expand on what has TTA been doing as well uh, in preparation of a sector that uh, is close to fully opening. Um, in an environment where we could live with COVID for a while. Um, so if you can take us through that, Nico. Uh, thanks, Manla. Uh, yeah, Chifewa, you guys have been doing a great job. Um, I and the TTI commend you guys for taking leadership and thank you for including us. Um, so we've had obviously a lot of our members. We represent currently uh, 567 members in the tourism industry. So uh, for the hotel side specifically, I know that there's been a lot of input from, from us that also has been sent through. Um, the, the protocols is, is, is great. It's, it's a stunning guideline and I think it's easy for private sector to follow. Um, the one thing that I think would be great is if we, could start focusing on the travelers because um, it's, it's quite simple for a, for a hotel. You know, we, we are private sector and if we have to implement certain uh, protocols, that's very quick for us to do because um, obviously um, we can implement them on the go. And the other thing is that, so, so I know that I've had a discussion on, on, on Sunday with Mr. Blessings Manale. He's the chief director for communications of Department of Tourism. He was actually at the hotel asking if we are opening the following day, which is Monday on the 1st. Uh, I gave him a call and I spoke to him about it and he was uh, doing a survey for the minister. And I specifically also said to him, I think it's going to be crucial for us to start focusing on the traveler, because if you look at the delegates and the officials that will be traveling, I think it's important to know what is it that they would expect from the industry. Um, it's easy for us to implement protocols, but if we do not know what exactly is it that they would need as a traveler, we can't sell accordingly. Um, the limitations currently in place is obviously a huge issue um, whereby um, hotels also have got restaurants and uh, sit down restaurants have got limitations and they, you're not allowed to, to have people to sit down, um, which is a concern in an RPC conference thing, which is a huge part of business um, specifically in, in, in Tuani. Uh, because we are focusing on government business. 90% of our business is normally government business. So I think directives for travelers are going to be key um, so that we understand what is it that they expect from us. I think people we need to start talking about Tuani and uh, spreading the word that it's, it's safe to come to Tuani. You know, we obviously are recognized as a, as a hotspot and that comes with responsibility so that we can make sure that our products are on par 
and uh, the protocols are in place, but most importantly that we are actually doing what our travelers need currently because we are in a completely unfamiliar uh, territory with COVID-19 and and travelers, um, when they come to the hotel, what would be the standard in terms of, of what are we uh, supplying? Breakfast, lunch, and dinners. What would be the protocol specifically or the standards regarding that? Um, you know, do we do lunch packs, uh, room service? Um, and all of those things uh, is going to be important. Um, so, so I think, so I think if, if anything, we, we definitely need to start focusing on the travelers as well. Um, the, the one thing that TTA has also been very proactively uh, doing is uh, we've been uh, focusing on the restaurant industry. I think they are really um, struggling. I cannot imagine even pubs and bars and clubs what they are going through at the moment, but you can just imagine. But restaurants specifically, I think, are very frustrated at this point in time because of the limitations. So limitations on 50 people, including staff, um, is not feasible. And also what we have done is we are busy uh, communicating with TBS CSI to uh, put through a communication uh, that we can specifically focus on percentage of occupancy. So different properties are different sizes. So having a fixed limitation of 50 people um, on a property is, I think, if I think of a hotel, 50 people, including guests, you, uh, staff and guests, you, you can't open. You, you actually, it's not possible. Um, same with conferencing going forward, restaurants, some restaurants are much bigger than others. So I think a, a percentage would, would work better and it would be more feasible uh, for people to operate and obviously provided that protocols are followed. But I think that's the, that's the big thing for us at the moment is the, the number of guests um, and the number of people on a property. Uh, those, are, those are the things that is a, is a huge concern for us at the moment. Yeah, um, I'll just go back to Chifira on this one. Um, is there any um, work that has been done to look at the needs of the traveler as part of perhaps uh, future communication with, with government? Or is there a way we can submit um, proposals uh, through to you uh, um, around the needs of the traveler? Um, the way this is designed uh, is designed to protect, you know, the staff and the travelers. Remember, what we're trying to do with the protocols is, is to try to say to the, to the customers that, you know, it's safe to come to our properties. It's safe to come to our restaurants. Uh, it's safe to, to, to you know, uh, be in a you know, guest house and any other place that uh, tourists go to. So there is that element that we are safe and we need to send that message that uh, we can operate within the environment that we are in. And that is the gist of creating the, 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 the protocols. Now, outside mm -hmm. of creating, a, outside of the protocols is to say, you know, how do we, uh, how do we ensure uh, that this is applicable or this is operationalized, so to speak? Because people come from different areas. You have people that are coming from urban areas. You've got people that are coming from rural areas and township areas. Now, we look into all that when we're, when we're dealing with this matter to say, you know, you know, how do we ensure that this can be done, you know, in Mamilodi or in Soshangove, uh, in a place where people buy food or in a place where there's a restaurant township. Uh, the principles of the protocols are quite straightforward and simple, and people should be able to go there and say, this is what has happened. Uh, this is what we're doing in terms of when you enter, sanitization, social distancing, so forth and so on. So, 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 so we design it with the customer in mind to say, how do we protect our customers? But more importantly, how do we protect our staff? And, and that was, you know, uh, uh, the, the guiding principles. Now, I saw that there were a few questions that people have asked on the Q&A to say, you know, uh, we did not reach the township or rural area. You know, I would admit that we didn't reach everyone, but we reached the majority of people. Uh, and we spoke to a lot of people in townships who operate restaurants to say, you know, is this feasible? Can this be done? And if so, you know, is this easy to implement? We do realize that, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, some of these things are going to be costly. 
uh, and we perhaps need to 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 put together um, training for for these guys to do uh, in various in you know, online platform and any other platform that we can come up with. We are busy working on that. We should be able to 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 talk about something in the weeks, well, not even few weeks, uh, but few days to come uh, in terms of the training. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of prepar- preparation of material and staff training, I've spoken about staff training, preparation of material, anyone is feel free to take information from the protocol, prepare your own material where you can do the, the, the training or can create pamphlets and so forth and so on to make sure people can see what they need to do when they arrive at your establishment. Uh, but we are looking also at preparing some posters that we can make available that people can download and print themselves and put out there for their customers. Uh, but when we design these protocols, uh, we should remember that it's all about de-risking the sector, ensuring that we can go back to, to work. Uh, there can be some aspects of, uh, of tourism that can be opened. And we are at a point now where there are certain aspects that are open and we are fighting to get more aspects of tourism to be open. And we believe that we should be able to get some, some of those few ones you know, uh, to come up in the, in the next couple of weeks. So we have made the, the, the representation for restaurants, uh, meaning the sit-down restaurants. Uh, we should be able to get our answer after the next uh, National Corona Command Council seat. Uh, in terms of you know where we're going, we are busy lobbying you know for that to open, but there will be more work that's going to be coming up in terms of application of protocols, making sure that all of us within the sector are, comp- are comply to the protocols, uh, because if one of us don't do it right and we get an inspection, the entire industry could be closed down. So it's that important that you know we all follow as much as we can the protocols that we've put out. Um, and also, if there are any things that you know you need to input, uh, you can go via the the Sony Tourism. We're working with them, uh, Sony Tourism Association. They should be able to send us you know your inputs, and we should be able to look at changing where we need to make changes. It's a it's a living document. It's not a set in stone or cast in stone where you know you cannot change it. We can change it as long as it makes sense. Uh, and of course, when the risk levels of coronavirus, uh, you know, decreases, uh, so is the, so are the protocols. Uh, they are linked to the risks that are within the country, and the lesser the risk, the lesser the protocols. Mm. Thank you. Uh, before you go, um, I have a question from Sean, who wants to know if um, conferences for essential services can be held. Um, and um, if, do you want to take that quickly? Yeah, I've, I've had a couple of uh, uh, inquiries, uh, you know, yesterday and today, where there are government departments that wants to have meetings, uh, some of them coming from the Department of Justice. Uh, it is something that I'm discussing with uh, the Department of Tourism to say, you know, small meetings, you know, that they want to have as government, you know, provided, you know, there's protocols, should those go ahead? Uh, and if yes, I will communicate. If no, I will communicate. It's something that I've put out to them, uh, and uh, we should be able to get some answers towards the end of the day today. Thank you. And um, we will also communicate through our own platforms when you get those answers to 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 all of the people who uh, are interested in knowing um, whether or not to start with arrangements of such. Um, now moving on to to business resilience. Uh, a lot of uh, our product owners are SMMEs who run small businesses, and uh, small businesses really live from hand to mouth. A prolonged uh, situation like the COVID nineteen problem uh, uh, has had a devastating effect on many of them. Now uh, Bueller uh, has worked on a paper around SME. SMME resilience, um, as well as recovery. Um, and I'd like uh, to just give us a bit of, of, some, of some nuggets from that paper. Um, while we prepare for the reopening of the sector, we're preparing our businesses. Um, these are businesses that we must run, they must be profitable in order for them to, to, to be able to uh, employ people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, take care of liabilities, etc. So, Pula, can you help us with some of the key tenants 
on your paper around um, resilience and recovery? Uh, thank you, Manda, and good day to my fellow panelists and uh, participants on this webinar. Um, uh, firstly, in terms of um, who we are as uh, how Wang, we are a strategy and scenario planning uh, firm. And, you know, from time to time, we're always looking at the horizon to see what is happening, what are the trends, and um, what are the things that industries, uh, you know, varied industries need to prepare themselves for. And um, as part of the work that we do, um, we participated and were moderators last year at the Risk and Resilience um, Council Summit, which took place in Johannesburg. And it's quite interesting that almost a year uh, to the time, because we had this in July, where we are looking at South Africa from a risk and resilience perspective, um, looking at what are the things that we need to look out for. And the interesting thing um, as part of the outcomes from that summit was that there needs to be uh, more educational focus on entrepreneurship, supporting small businesses that provide experiences in tourism. So even before this calamity, the importance of, of small business as part of the whole tourism um, ecosystem has been highlighted before, uh, not just for us as a destination, but globally. And so when we bring it closer home, um, this pandemic uh, has spared uh, no destination. Uh, traveling tourism, as we know, has been the most impacted. And uh, there are various uh, recovery uh, scenarios that are being painted. McKinsey presented a paper a week ago that looked at various scenarios of recovery. But most of it, at best, uh, you know, we, we start to see the return of some travel 21, 22, um, conservatively 23, 24. But you even have those scenarios that say, actually, we're looking at uh, demand return, returning to 2019 levels post 2024. And so what happens to the businesses in the meantime? And uh, what we have seen, some of the trends is that uh, various businesses are looking at what services they offer and what services are required. And uh, part of it is the issue of hospitality and meetings. Um, while, whilst you're a hospita hospitality business, um, there are opportunities for repurposing. Um, you, you see in Europe, uh, some of the restaurants becoming uh, food retailers, fresh food retailers. They also had um, a different lockdown from us where they could sell hot foods, for example. And so repurposing and looking at your business for repurposing and starting to see within this crisis, what are the opportunities becomes now the game for any business. When you hear that um, from the National Accommodation Association that about 70 to 80% of uh, their members are, are afraid that they're going to be closing down and some have already started shutting down. It is um, a concern and it is one that one needs to look at it from the perspective of if you're not providing meeting spaces, um, what can those spaces be used for? And in that, uh, you start to ensure that Tourism businesses are not lost in this economy, but continue to provide the very critical jobs that are required. But, you know, first things first, and this uh, goes, takes us back to what um, the CEO at the TPSA presented in terms of the protocols. First and foremost, um, if you're planning to reopen, is the question of familiarizing yourself with those protocols. And um, there are three pillars to it, essentially. It's the issue of your guests. I think we've lost Bula's uh, connection there. Hello. Are you back, Bula? Yes, we had lost you a bit yes. there. Perhaps you, perhaps you can close your your video so you can so we can enhance your audio. It should be better now. Okay, please proceed. Okay. Sorry about that, but I was just highlighting that. Um, no, we're still having the audio um, problem. Of, uh, travelers, top priority. Oh, 
Okay, while we try to sort out Bueller's uh, um, audio problem, um, so Lani, can you come into into the fray as well? Um, you are from Dinukeng. Um, on over the weekend, the minister announced that uh, some uh, elements of tourism, such as self drives and and such, can open. Um, how have you guys received that? And how are you planning to open for for those elements? And um, you can also then just chat to us around an issue that has been raised before, the training of staff. Um, uh, what what do you what would you say or what would you advise uh, all of all of us around the training of staff and preparing of staff? Uh, as a, as it, it has been mentioned earlier, this is actually a, an issue of trust. Um, so if we if we commit ourselves to these regulations and these protocols, um, and um, just one mistake at one lodge somewhere uh, can cause all of all of our progress to collapse, and therefore I, I believe it would be important to make sure that our staff understand exactly what do they need to do. So can you please take us through uh, those two questions, please? Okay. Thank you for the opportunity that we are being granted to talk about our area. Before I can start with this uh, post-COVID-19, I would like to thank the provincial government for helping us to establish this um, tourism region, which has been around for more than 20 years. And um, in 20 years, a lot of experience has been um, gathered within this industry, within some of the establishments. We are situated in the northeast section of the province between Tuane and Houghton province. And the area covers 280,000 hectares, of which your question is so relevant that an area so big, if we are looking, not looking at the risk, what then? What are we going to do? And are we ready for this um, post um, lockdown? Dinokeng um, can do better within the domestic tourism. It is 15 kilometers away from Church Square in Victoria, with the northeast western boundary towards Emalafe. So um, the opportunity that we can have within our area, because it's malaria free. Now, when we look into the risk, as we are asking, we have around 400 members, meaning the establishment, the product, which includes accommodation, conferencing, games, and other activities within the area. So we employ around 3,005 employees, and the dependents that they have is almost 14,000, which are impacted mainly with this um, lockdown. Over the years, Dinokeng did not build much um, reserve to keep the industry on board after the lockdown. So for us, we are getting excited that at least some part of this has been um, lifted up like game drive. Within the game drive, we've already identified that it's important um, to have our game drive sanitized train our our guys about the COVID-19. So before you open for us, we were also thinking that self-drive would be easier because you're not gonna come in contact with the, the, the people or the guests. However, we are so excited that, 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 that now you have opened us to do the actual game drive of which Revenue will take place, and then employment is going to take place. So what has been put together in some of the places has already been put in place. The first thing that has to happen is to contentize the employee emotionally. Firstly, before you give me a training as to what has to happen. So the plan is we have to have our employees to have emotional training to understand better this COVID, the impact that can have so that when they are um, taking care of the clients 
or the deaf, they already have been trained or they've been assisted in listening. So staff is the main asset of the building. So the starting point that we should have is to train them about sanitization, about the access control, housekeeping, looking into changing the HR policies that we have. In the past, staff members would come and go without being tested for COVID-19. Accountable because we're talking about the lives of people, even though we want to generate income. But what is important, the life and the health of everyone is very, very important. So, um, within the area, we've got a lot of experienced um, activities and products that have been adhering to some of the um, protocols that are being given now. For us, is just to enhance what is already been there and follow the World Health Organization as well as the protocol that um, CBSA is trying to do. We've got different facilities that some of them are not being open as yet, like your restaurant. However, in that case, it will affect big time on the revenue side but we are trying to adhere to the rules and giving a plan and also trying to ask the government to see our plan as to how ready and what can be done for social distancing and ensuring that everyone is taking the safety of our guest space in this situation. So now, regarding our our, our places and the issue of guests being concerned that the staff is going to contaminate them and so forth. Most of the establishments do have accommodation for the staff and we are encouraging some of those that don't have, that have an opportunity to do that, to have staff not commuting uh, a lot and meeting a lot of the public. And some of them, like in, inside the game museum, some of the product owners, they're already starting to take their employees from one point to the other. So this is a great opportunity that we think we are ready at you know, game as a whole. And as you know that when you're talking about you know, game, we're not talking only of you know, game game museum. We've got four hearts, we've got Kalimen, We've got water plus stem, we've got you know, game central as well as the game drive. So game drive is not taking place only in the reserve. There are other establishments, maybe in the center, that have got animals, which is not the big five, but they do have some of the animals within the um, area. Thank you so, very much. Uh, so, oh, sorry, sorry, proceed. Yeah. Um, the challenge that we're going to have if we are not open, we will have um, the issue that a lot of establishments might not open at all. Asking and thinking that if we could use the opportunity for the June 16 as the start of our of our domestic travel, that will give us a good kickstart as an organization or as product owner. Thank you. Thank you, Solani. I think for me, what's key from what you've just said um, is that uh, as people who are running uh, tourism, just because uh, the minister has said uh, such and such can open does not mean we should open it even at a point when we are not ready yet. Um, and I think that's key that we need to make sure that we get all our ducks in a row uh, before we open any of the elements that we need to open. As we said earlier, this is a, this is a game of trust. We, if we do things correctly, that will encourage the government to, 
to work with us to open more areas within the sector. I also liked what you said around taking care of the psychological um, or the, the emotional uh, trauma that some of our employees have experienced uh, because we've had, uh, many of us um, within the sector have had to lay off a number of our employees because of lack of income. Um, so we need to be able to, while looking at training them, be aware of some of the things that they've gone through over over the uh, this uh, COVID period. Um, I think um, I think that really helps. Um, we are getting a number of questions um, and colleagues. I will be fielding your questions to the panelists. Um, uh, but before we do that, I'd like us to hear from Susan. Um, Susan um, is going to talk to us from a perspective of a traveler, a visitor, what is a visitor going to be looking out for? Um, uh, we have mentioned this right at the top of the conversation. And um, Susan, can you, can you take us through what you believe would make a traveler trust us uh, better than, um, than, the next, uh, than, than the next destination? What are the things that we should be looking out for that will make Tswane a better destination than another destination uh, in the eyes of a traveler? Thank you, Manda. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is a really great question and one that I think we must really give a bit of attention to as well. So as the ultimate Pretoria bucket list, we represent some of our most exciting hotels, guest houses, attractions, restaurants, lodges, activities and events in Chwane. And this is a wide range of product. And um, first of all, as we've mentioned now, Solani spoke about it, Mandla mentioned it just now, is to have our health and safety protocols in place. Guys, before you open, we have the time now, most of us have the time now, make sure this is 100% in place because travelers, local and international, will be looking for this for a long, long time. The second thing um, really is communication. And along with communication, I want to add simplicity. Please let's not overcomplicate our communication to guests. Show them clearly what they can expect, what is in place, use your social media, use your website, communicate with people, send an email to your bookings, update your terms and conditions, make sure that guests know what is going on. It's so important. I will speak about that again a bit later. Um, and then the third thing that is a big international trend right now, also in the countries that are starting to open up again, is value for money. Many people will have less to spend, but I can tell you people will travel again, people will do things again. And they will be looking for value for money and exceptional experiences, bucket list type experiences, things that you can post on your Instagram and your Facebook and say, I'm out there again doing these things. So make sure you are offering the best of what you are offering. And then the last thing um, really ties in nicely. I see Peter Schwart asked a question there about the psychological effects and our human connection. And that is such a good point. Remember, above all, we are in the service industry. We need to maintain that human connection. Take care of people. You can't see me smiling behind my mask. Make sure that people are feeling comfortable and happy coming to your product when we open again. Guys, if we start with these things and our natural, natural flair and magic that we have to our city, then, then I really think we can, we can come back eventually stronger than we were. Uh, I think that's, that's beautiful, Susan. Um, uh, this morning on CNN, I saw a, a, an advert for, the, for Bahrain. 
Um, and it struck me because the advert says, um, if you thought you knew us before, uh, think again. And basically what it's driving is that um, we've, we, we, we know the world has changed, um, but we have changed to accommodate those changes as well. So if you thought you knew us before, think again. And I think that is what is driving us as well. We should be taking the, the, the same mold, really, um, that um, uh, our visitors um, um, should understand that we, we understand their needs. Um, we are one step ahead all the time. Um, and also we, we are, our, I like what you say, what you say around communication as well. Our communication should not be overly com complicated and cold. It should be easy to understand. Um, uh, but what's most important, I believe, is communication. We should be communicating with all of the people who have visited our, um, our, our, our attractions, our hotels, our BNBs, etc. Um, you mentioned Peter, Peter, Peter's question, Peter Swart's question there. I'm going to throw that question uh, to Chifiwa. Um, Peter is talking about how meetings are supposed to get people together. Um, uh, and because of the social distancing measures, um, we, will, we have to have people sitting far apart, one and a half meter apart. People are talking through masks and screens. Um, and he says, this is a foreign and it's an unnatural experience. Um, it's designed to create barriers when the actual purpose of meeting is to bring people together. Um, and then he's asking uh, Chifiwa on what your thoughts are on how we can deal with the psychological effects uh, of, of these measures. So the fact that, um, you know, you, you, you are creating relationships, you want to be closer to people, um, and yet um, the new normal says, be farther from people, uh, don't touch people. Uh, drug, speak through masks, etc. Et so, um, what what can we do over and above um, the black and white of, of 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 protocols? What can we do to deal with the psychological effects of these measures? Uh, thank you very much. I think you know the meeting that we're having today. Um, you know, we're having it over you know, platform like Zoom or Teams and many other platforms that are out there. Uh, it shows, you know, the times that we're in uh, and it means that we've got to adapt to the times that we're in because uh, uh, if we don't adapt to the times that we're in, uh, as the sector, we won't be able to survive. So I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, is quite critical. Now, is it ideal for, this, for the industry in terms of making business sense? May not be that ideal, but we could make it ideal at some point if we are forced to do so. Uh, I think that, you know, I agree that the meetings are, are made to be, uh, uh, you know, people gathering, knowing each other and talking to each other, but this is a, a different time. It's unprecedented and that we, we've got to adapt to, to, to what we have around us in order for us to, to do business. So I think it's driven largely by that. Like I said, if, 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 if the risk levels go down, it means that uh, you know, we, we will try to go back to as much normal as possible. But I think it's gonna be a different normal than what we know. If I can tackle that, there, there was another question around uh, the cost of PPE. Uh, it is something that we, we, we've kept in mind. We know that it's costly. We know that uh, uh, you know, a lot of small businesses won't have money to buy the PPEs, but we've got to recognize where we are. Uh, if we go and say, we can't do this, it means that we have to wait until the, the risk of the virus is low to be able to operate. So us as an industry, you know, we have a choice to make. If we want to operate, we need to sacrifice to be able to operate. Government is never going to let us go back to what we were doing without applying the measures that we have seen up being applied in the supermarkets. When you go and buy food and so forth and so on, you stand in queues 
uh, we can't just go and say, but we, we want to be exempted. We want to go back to where everything was. Uh, that opportunity is not now. And we hope that, you know, as soon as the, 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 the cure is found uh, or the vaccine is found, we can be able to go to that kind of situation. But for now, we have to work with what we have and we have to implement what we have to ensure that we can go back to some level of economic activity and we're not waiting until we go to level one. That is the choice that we have and it's a choice that everyone have and the entire industry value chain has. And I think that, you know, it, as much as we recognize the costly uh, part, the cost part of the PPEs, something that we're looking at, we may put together a marketplace and negotiate some prices, centralize it and make sure that people can be able to buy. We're talking to various companies to see if they can donate or they can assist the sector, uh, be it financially or with some of the equipments uh, that may be needed. But it's, a, it, it's something that we're working on. I cannot promise that. But I think you know, the central part is that for us to go back to work, for us to be able to operate, there has to be some level of protocols that we need to put in place. And that is why we developed the document that we developed. And anyone can extract from that document, implement it, Let's demonstrate that you know, we're a compliant sector. And also we're a very much sanitized industry. So we don't need to do much. We have been cleaning our rooms. We have been cleaning our vehicles. Uh, we've been cleaning the tables at the restaurants. So it's just a matter of how do we take that to the next level? And how do we make sure that you know, if, if we require to put in 60% or 70% alcohol content-based sanitizer, you know, we, we comply to that. Uh, we don't have much of any other choice but to get into this so that we can have you know, some economic activity. We do hope that the virus uh, risk goes down and therefore you know, the protocol levels will also go down. Certain things may not be required, uh, but for now we need to work with what we have. We need to implement what we have. We need to make sure that we can demonstrate to government that we can comply. Thank you, Chifua. Um, there is a uh, contribution by Marius on the chat where he's saying that trust needs to be gained uh, from our clients uh, regarding safety, uh, fogging, misting, spraying, disinfecting, um, using certified medical disinfectants, um, uh, demonstrating valid certificates um, uh, or, or or valid certificates that need to be issued to hotels, restaurants, etc. Those would demonstrate trust. Um, so you know, it's it's going back to a degrading system. For instance, when you walk into a hotel and it's a four star or a five star, you know what to expect. So if you walk into a hotel and there's certification around, um, it's uh, uh, cleanliness and health, health and safety that gives you some level of comfort as a traveler. And I think, um, I think that's a great contribution. And I know from, it, from the Tswane Tourism Association uh, perspective, uh, there's been talk around how we can be more uh, engaged around self-certification uh, and NICO, um, just making sure that um, the protocols as they are developed, um, we implement in each of our uh, in each of our institutions or establishments, and we show, we demonstrate to to the traveller that our 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 establishments are safe. Um, what what would you like to contribute on on that issue, um, Nico? Thanks, Manla. Yeah, I think it's very important that we have a united front. Um, I think one thing that we definitely have uh, learned from the situation that we're currently in is that um, we all have to be on the same page. Um, unity is, is, is power. I think from, uh, from what we have seen in the past, is like we've all been working in silos. Um, this is something that we're all going through at the same time. But for the most part, we're all going through the same thing. And I think when it comes to the certain industries within tourism, it's going to be very important and key that we offer the same, that we give our guests the impression that Twani is safe, not just certain products that you have to go to. So our chair uh, person, um, Mr. Bronwyn Cadle de Ponte, 
she um, specifically said that we need to focus on 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 verification within Tuani. And I think you know using the protocols is which is already great. Um, but currently, we are allowing any people uh, or any organization within the tourism industry to form part of TTA. We are not charging membership fees for people that are joining. And also, Chafiwe, thank you so much for offering the TTA free membership during this time for TBCSA. I think working together is key and um, have a united front. So from a, from a safety point of view, it's going to be key that we all follow the same protocols. It's, a, it's going to be important that if we have sanitizers as it, you walk into properties, say, for instance, hotels, that we all have the same thing. Because if we want to be competitive in a, in a very competitive market going forward with limited business, we're going to be we're going to have to make sure that people, irregardless of where they're going to in Tuani, they're going to have the same experience. They're going to feel, listen, we, we feel safe. We uh, do not mind traveling to Tuani because of the fact that they are, uh, we're a hotspot. It's not going to make a difference because you, they can see. So it's one thing to have certificates up on the wall and, and all of those. But ultimately, it's about what the guest is going to see how they're going to spread the word and how they're going to speak to the, their fellow colleagues that's also been used to traveling. That's going to be key. We all need to be doing the same thing. So now more than ever, unity is, is going to be very important for us to go forward and, um, and to, again, you can put whatever certificate you want on the wall. If your guests are not going to see that your staff is wearing masks, that they're sanitizing, um, not just where the guest walks in, you have to have sanitizing units where the staff walks in. So it's not about just the perspective of, of what the guest would see. It's an overall mindset. Like um, Chafiwa said, we are in this pandemic, we have this situation, and we're going to have to adapt. I saw that Philip, um, the indie from uh, Morningstar, the group, he said about the PPE and the cost. I we would probably have to pay for it on a property level, and and our members are going to have to fork out these extra expenses. And this is going to be the price of doing business during the COVID nineteen. It's not, uh, it's nobody's fault, but it's definitely something that we all have to step up and and make sure that we do accordingly. So from that perspective as well, and. Chifewa just mentioned it now that we look at suppliers that can give us good prices so that we don't in work in silos again where people are procuring the same equipment for more expensive, which makes no sense. I think it's about supply and demand. And if we make sure that we stand together as the industry and then there's certain suppliers that is not going to rip you off or, or think that now because you're down and out, they can take advantage. I don't think there's place for that in our industry at all, specifically that we are struggling and we've got many restrictions. It shouldn't be high prices as well. Thank you, Nico. Um, we are about to close our session, so uh, we only left with two minutes. Um, there were lots of questions, lots of engagement from, from the attendees. Thank you very much. Um, for those who are on social media, um, our hashtag for today is Tuane Tourism Future. And I think we need to keep the engagement going around the Tuane Tourism Future. Um, I just have one quick question for, for Susan. Uh, Susan, um, you spoke earlier um, about and uh, how we should keep communication uh, open with our travelers. Um, there's a question around whether you believe it's important to, um, the same training uh, that we give to our staff around uh, being safe uh, in, in, in the COVID environment, if we can share that with travelers as well and train travelers as well on how to be safe and, um, and clean uh, in a COVID-19 environment. Just 30 seconds on that. I think it's really important and we have so many wonderful ways to share this, in, this information through our social media. I'm doing a letter that I'm putting in my own guest house for guests when they check in eventually when we are lucky enough to get bookings again. And like I said earlier as well, make it warm and personal and make them almost part of the team. Because as you said earlier, it's if everyone adheres to these regulations, then, then we can stay open and we can go forward instead of backwards. 
Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, we will be sharing some documents that uh, come out of this discussion. Um, we will send you an email with a link on, on where to download some of the documents. Some of you have been asking for uh, some of the documents referred to in, in these discussions. Uh, we promise to send you those. Um, and we've come to, unfortunately, the end of our discussions, even though uh, we still had a number of burning questions, but it just goes to show that these engagements are important and they help us with moving forward. We will schedule other um, uh, engagements with you. I believe there are some un unanswered questions coming from, from this webinar that we'd like to stretch a little bit further um, and discuss and find solutions for. Um, so please be on the lookout for, uh, for our communications. I'd like to thank you, uh, thank the panelists uh, for making time for us and being available and giving us um, uh, out of their busy schedules, uh, giving us uh, not just their time, but their invaluable contribution uh, to us uh, in the sector in Tuane. I'd like to thank all of the uh, attendees for, for joining us. Um, remember our hashtag is Tuane Tourism Future um, and let's continue building for our future as Tuane. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.